Hello and welcome. You are listening to the Talking Locks podcast with Lockitude. This is the Everyday People with Locks series and I'm your host, Adi Balogun. This episode is produced by Savage Media. Today, we discuss locks and the LGBT community. While one person can't speak for all, we make a connection to the community through our guest, Pamela Adie and her experiences. Pamela is a Nigerian LGBT rights activist, public speaker, screenwriter, and filmmaker. She is also the executive director of a non-governmental organization called the Equality Hub. Pamela is also a dear friend, huge supporter of Lockheed, and a longtime customer. In this episode, the EHTV Network and Equality Hub are providing us with a promo code that allows you to see her latest production, Ife, at a discount. And now, without further ado, let's get right into it. Hi, Pamela. Welcome to the Talking Locks with Locketude podcast. And this is the Everyday People with Locks series. I'm very happy to have you here. Um... Please, can you go ahead and tell us, you know, maybe your full name and a little bit about yourself? Okay, thank you for having me, Adi. My name is Pamela Adi. I'm a filmmaker and an LGBT rights advocate. I work for the Equality Hub, which is an organization that uses uh, visual storytelling to advocate for um, the rights and acceptance of LBQ women lesbian, bisexual, and queer women in Nigeria. I live in Lagos, and that's pretty much it. Okay, great. Um, I think the next best first question I can ask is, how long have you had your locks? So, um, this is the second time that I actually uh, have locks, so I'm on my second lock journey. The first time... Uh, before I cut my hair uh, last year, I had locks for eight years, and, um, and then I cut it all off, and then I started the new, my second journey uh, about a month ago. So my new locks are about a month old. Oh my God, you're a baby, and at the same time, you're like a full-grown adult <laughs> with locks. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Um, we'll come back to talking a little bit more about your locks, but... Um, I wanted to shed some more light for people who may not know and people will be wondering. In the LGBT community, and you did say your work is specifically for L, B, and the Q, but there's so many letters. There's the L, G, B, T, Q, which we're more familiar with, and there's an I and there's an A. Can you briefly try and explain to us what the differences are and how they are you know, um, seen as, or how I put it, how they're categorized almost in the same group, but yet it's all different. So LGBTQI is an acronym for um, sexual minorities. When I say sexual minorities, I mean lesbian, bisexual, um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, um, queer, intersex, trans, and um, asexual people. And so um, pretty much, I think people already know what lesbian means. First to a woman who is, um, you know, sexually, physically, and emotionally attracted to um, another woman or women. And obviously gay is referring to um, a man who is uh, emotionally, sexually, physically um, attracted to other men. And then uh, bisexual people are people who are uh, attracted to people of um, both men and women um, or people that do not identify as any specific gender. Um, trans people are people who were, who transitioned from their sex of birth to a different um, sex mm-hmm. um, or gender. Uh, and then you have intersex people who are people who, who were born with both genitalia, um, people who were born with both male and female genitalia. Um, and then you have uh, asexual people who, 
who are um, who who do not um, have any um, how do I say this? They they are not interested in having sex. Um, they're not attracted to to um. How do I say that now? How do I explain that? Social people are people who are not interested in having sex. Um, so it doesn't matter if you're male or female. They are not. They are pretty much um, just interested in the people, but not really in sex. And a sexual a sexuality is. Uh, they are very. It's a very broad um, spectrum, mm-hmm. which I don't think I, I should go into right now. But yeah. if someone is interested in in reading up, there's a lot of information online about that. Okay, it's um very interesting, and thanks for taking out your time to like explain all the alphabets within the 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 group, as it is. And um, while you were speaking, I liked the word that you used, um, sexual minorities, because a lot of people might be wondering why are we even doing a podcast themed locks on LGBT. Um, for me, who have have, have run um, a lock studio for six years by July now, I do know that a good percentage of my customers are from the LGBTQ community. So that kind of makes me want to wonder, like, you know, what is the link? And I feel that having locked hair um, in Nigeria, especially, you are seen as part of the minority. And you did say that this group of people are sexual minority. So I think my next question is, do you think there's even any link with why people who identify and who are, let me not say identify, who are LGBTQ um, or who are amongst the sexual minorities, let me put it that way, also decide to use locked hair as a means of expression of self? Um, I, I don't know that there's any uh, <laughs> official or studied link, um, mm-hmm. but I think that um a lot of people in this community um I, okay i think first of all even having locks in a place like nigeria is already like a rebellious thing you are already going against um the quote unquote social norms of what what people consider um beautiful hair or good hair because People who are, because locks, or what they call it, uh, you know, dreadlocks, which I don't call it anymore, or what people call dada, mm-hmm. it's usually um, something that people say uh, for, like, quote-unquote rascals. You know, you maybe smoke weed, or you are not taken seriously, or, you know, it is not a, it's not a presentable way of, of carrying your hair, and all of those colonial... Um, the colonialist language that came with colonization. Um, so I, I think that, um, I think that, so even just having locks alone is already something that is, is seen as taking back your power, um, you know, and self-expression. So I'm not really sure why the community feels like that is a lot or a lot of people in that community have locks. But I, I can speak for myself. Yes, so I was going to get there. When, yeah, exactly. So when I started my, my locks, for me, it was a sign of freedom. It was, a, it was something that I was doing to express myself to, to because, you know, when, when you have been... When it's almost like you don't really know that you've been caged or you are set free. <laughs> uh, so when when I when I set myself free by coming out of the closet, I I, I really um, felt like I needed. I wanted to do something to my hair that was expressive of that, and so that was why I I decided to lock my hair and. And which is why my hair will always be locked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, even if I may have breaks, maybe one or two years, but I always come back to my dada. Mm-hmm. Because uh, for me, you know, uh, and another thing too is it's it's very African. It's it is it is it's the way that kinky hair is supposed to grow until you know the white man came and told us different. So 
everything changed from, from then on. So I see it also as part of going back to my roots and mm. being true to myself. Mm, mm. Oh, um, I think that your, your statement's very concise, but it's packed with a lot of um, strong words that I personally identify with, not only having locks myself, but just understanding the fact that um, you do feel a sense of freedom, a sense of going back to your roots, a sense of your being African. So I want to talk a little bit now about the work you're doing in activism of the LB. LGBTQ community in the sense that um, whilst this program is very much about locks, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to see, I think this conversation is really pondering and saying, hmm, if so many people in the LGBT community choose to choose locks as a hairstyle and as a freedom of expression, you know, is there a link? But you did say um, locks um, as viewed especially in Nigeria, as a form of rebellion and as a, a way of deviating from social norms. People, and I think the work I have been doing personally at Lockitude is trying to make people see that if there's supposed to be anything as, like a social norm, it should be locking your hair. That should be the first normal. And wearing a weave is actually deviating from social norms. So I'm wondering... If in the work you're doing activism, well, this question, I feel like I'm going around in circles, but <laughs> anyway, I'll get to it. I'm wondering if the work you're doing activism, do you feel like, are you trying to normalize um, the sexual minorities with your work? Is that what it is about? Is that a way of describing it? Is there, is there, is there any link to that? Is there a link to, to, uh, sorry, I didn't get the exact question, sorry. Okay, so my question is, I think in my own work personally with locks, I'm trying to get people to see that locks is a form of wearing your hair as an African, of being true to yourself. And in the conversation, you did mention that you chose to lock your hair at the point where you decided to come out of a closet in being true to yourself. So now um, the question really is, in my understanding, um, LGBTQIA is not a choice, is how you are. And so I'm trying to understand what activism in, the, in that community means for you. What are you trying to achieve with your activism? Okay. Okay, I understand your question now. Yes, so definitely. Um, obviously, the things that we, um, the, in my work, the big thing that um, we try to advocate for is um, is there are very two big, no, I should not say two, three big things or three major things. Number one, we always have um, we always see reports in the news about violence, about uh, people um, getting killed or getting arrested, you know, um, just because they are they are LGBT or because they um, somebody uh, you know told the police that they are having a party and mm -hmm. the people who are having a party there are LGBT people, so police will run there and arrest people, uh, you know, we also have the, the uh, same-sex marriage prohibition act, which uh, states that, you know, you, you can't marry somebody of same sex, it says you, you cannot, um, you, you cannot show same-sex affection in public, <laughs> you know, it says uh, you cannot run what they call a gay organization. Um, and so, and then obviously in the north you have the um, the legal code. Uh, is it legal code? Sorry, the um, penal penal code. Sorry, mm -hmm. you have the penal code that um, says that you can be killed. Uh, you know, if you are if you are caught, you know, in the act of having um, sex with someone of the same sex. So all of these things, there are obviously also people who have lost their jobs because maybe they were outed, people who have been kicked out of their homes, rejected by their families. Some landlords have thrown people out of their um, out of their apartments or homes because somebody outed them. 
you know, there are so many things. There's harassment. There are so many things that happen to LGBT people solely because of their sexual orientation and gender identity. And so the core of my activism is one, to stop all of that, to to to, to say that that LGBT people are also people and Nigerians and we are entitled to the same rights as everybody else. So freedom of association, freedom of expression, um, uh, freedom to uh, we are not asking for marriage yet, but maybe eventually. Uh, eventually, obviously, freedom to marry, freedom to, you know, your rights as a tenant, your rights as as a, as, as a, somebody who, who um, sorry, the, the right to be protected in the, in the workplace from harassment, mm. you know. And we're also trying to, um, to, to help families to see that... Uh, Families that have people or children that identify as LGBT or that are LGBT, to be able to see that it is it is not uh, such such people are not under any kind of um, spiritual attack because you know that's what mm-hmm. that's the normal thing that people say or the usual thing that people say they say they will carry you to um, religious houses supposedly pray the gay away. You know, yeah. so we're trying to let people know that it is not this. That's that's actually not what it is, and it's not a sexual deviation. It is. It is not a social abnormality. Um, mm. LGBT people are normal people, like everybody else, like me, like you. Um, you know, and um, so we're, we're we're trying to see how that can happen. We're trying to see how people can be protected from um, from um, arbitrary arrests. Uh, from unauthorized detention, um, from you know being being uh, targeted just because of their sexual orientation, and, and all of that. So all of so really at the core of our advocacy is one social acceptance to legal change. Uh, when I say legal change, I mean uh, the change in in the legal system, and to see how being. Uh, um, um, same sex acts, okay. Uh, same sex sexual acts can mm. be um, decriminalized, um, and then also see how LGBT people can be protected in various um, spaces, you know, like work or home or, or you know, just other um, spaces in society in general. So that's really the core of what it's about. Yeah, um, I think the work you're doing is very, very um, important and very impactful for the community. And um, I just want to applaud you because it takes um, a lot of balls, if I may say, to stand up for just not yourself, but for other people. Um, Now, just what you were saying, I was just thinking about the vibe in Lockitude Studio when people come in, because we are 100% authentic lock salon um so everybody who walks into our space has one thing in common which is usually the hair and um no matter our religious beliefs sexual orientation um um corporate or non-corporate world you know you you it's a it's a mix of different type of people who tend to agree when we are in that space even though we have different things that kind of make us different from tribe and, um, you know, all sorts. I I really do find that um, it's always interesting that when you see people with locks in the Locketude studio specifically, the conversation flows. Everybody feels like a brother and sister. Even outside the studio, you meet a lockhead um, and you just, you know, have that nod with each other because you know that you share something in common um can you tell me what so so for me that's what kind of brings us together as lockheads and we kind of recognize that you are in most cases fighting subconsciously sometimes sometimes unconsciously towards some sort of stereotype or or discrimination what is that one thing you think you can help somebody who is struggling with homophobia um realize that an LGBT person is a person? Is there, do you have any thing that kind of breaks whatever shield is in front of someone's eyes or removes that log 
so that we can see past whatever preconceptions they have? Well, I mean, I don't think that you need anything to let to, to know that somebody else is a person because you know it's very obvious <laughs> that human beings are human beings, regardless of a person's sexual orientation or their gender identity or whatever. Because if you know, I have seen situations where people have told me, um, ah. I have this friend, a ah, very nice person, blah, 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 blah. We used to be cool, you know, I really like the person. And then I discovered that the person is gay. And then, uh, oh, I didn't want them to even touch me again. I didn't want them to even come near me. I didn't want to even have anything to do with them. And in my mind, I'm just like, okay, so the person was a human being then. Then you now discover that the person um, is attracted to people of the same sex and then all of a sudden, they have become the enemy. Like, does that make sense? Like, where, where, where is that coming from? Like, because the whole, the, the funny thing is, it is so, it is so uh, irrational. Because it's not, it's not like the person has done anything to you. Nobody, nobody has. They, they didn't want to offend you, you know. But what I, I discovered is, uh, sometimes people are motivated by, by. Um, Bias and um, ignorance, and and um, and what religious leaders and houses or authorities um, uh, preach, or what what they, they say. Some people may just be saying it because they, that because they think that's what they are expected to say. Mm. Um, some people may, you know, there there's so many there's so many reasons. There's so many reasons. Um, but I think it's pretty it's pretty obvious to 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 know that somebody is a human being and because of the fact that they're a human being, I think that should, that should be enough for you to for you to put things aside. However, we know that that is, that's not how society works because people are social creatures and people are socialized in certain ways. And so there are different... Um, I, I think for, for me, what, what I which is the core of my, my work, is to tell stories, mm. is to use stories to show the human side, to show, to, to confront people with their biases and to question, for them to question themselves, like, wait, to, this thing I'm doing, is it actually, is, there, is, it, is it actually working or is it, is it harming somebody? Is it is it causing other people pain? Is it you, do you understand? Mm-hmm. Like, and when I say this thing I'm doing, I mean homophobia mm-hmm. uh, and and being biased and being uh, and being dis- discriminatory, you know. So people need to people people need to maybe if people hear stories of other people and the suffering, the unnecessary suffering of other people just because of their sex. Or, I'm sorry, their sexual orientation. Mm. Maybe it might make people think because you know the funny thing I realized Nigerians we are so against racism and we are so against racism you would think that <laughs> that uh, racism exists in, in Nigeria in, in Nigeria but racism does not exist in Nigeria because we are actually more tribalist if we anything are, exactly well, exactly we here we discriminate against people based on their tribe, on their, you know, on where, where they come from. We discriminate against people based on their religion. We discriminate against people in this country based on even the uh, color of their skin. Now, these are all things that people were, were um, how do I say, that people were born into, mm. you know. You don't have control over your tribe. You don't have control over the color of your skin. You don't have control over what religion you were born into mm. until you grow up and then maybe you decide to do so but the point I'm trying to make is that it's the same thing as homophobia. Um it, once you start discriminating against people just because of how how they are, not because of what they have done to you, or not because they have done anything bad, then it's like a slippery slope. It's the same thing. Homophobia is the same thing as racism. The the very core of uh, the foundation of of that kind of hatred and discrimination is the same. Right. Hating people for who they are, not because of their character 
or anything that you don't to harm anyone. And so, uh, if people can see that discriminating against people because of their tribe or religion or even their sex is wrong, then I don't know why people cannot also see that discriminating against um, someone because of their sexual orientation, which is in it, you know, which they were born with, mm -hmm. is actually also wrong. So those are the parallels that I try to, to draw from time yeah. to time. Yeah. I get that. Okay, let's talk about your hair for a bit. So, eight years of having locks. You described it as a point in time where you associated deciding that hair choice as freedom. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? How did your hair make you feel free? Well, for the most part, uh, it made me feel free in the sense that I wasn't, I was able to choose what I wanted to do and I was choosing something that was um, that would that expresses that and the reason why I'm saying that is, is because as I said earlier you know having locks is is something that is not something that um, that is socially acceptable here mm -hmm. in this part of the world you know and that is in, in Nigeria because when you go to other African countries like South Africa almost everybody has that uh, Men mm -hmm. know, women know, mm -hmm. children know. It's Almost everybody choice. has locks. Yeah. Yes. So it's only in like you rarely find people with weaves and wigs and whatever in those countries. But, but when you come to Nigeria, it's like the the opposite. Mm -hmm. So even though I wasn't in Nigeria when I when I started my my locks, for me I knew what I was going through in my own personal life, mm -hmm. and. For me, having locks was freeing because it meant that I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't um, under the co social constructs of society. Right. It, it meant for me that I, I was, I had come to a point in my life where I was able to choose and choose consciously um, that I was breaking free from some of the colonial um, legacies that that were left behind by. British colonial, colon, colonialists, or mm -hmm. should I call them mm -hmm. colon, colonizers? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm actually so a bit quiet that's on that because I feel like um, the previous uh, episodes that we we um, we've recorded on this Everyday People with Locks series, I'm always bringing the colonial part of it. I, I can't help it. Once you start having the conversations and you realize that, why are you afraid of your hair? Why is why is your African matted hair so dreadful? Why? And you just realize it's because somebody said so. And this somebody doesn't even care exactly. about you. So why why are you holding on to that and projecting that on your brothers and sisters? Let me put it that way, people of your own race and trying to get people to move to this norm that is not even normal. It's the most ridiculous thing ever. Oh, okay. And um, I kind of admire because uh, I really did love your locks, the ones that have gone. And I, I, I'm happy that I was personally part of that journey for some part of that eight years. And then you started by, first of all, cutting off two on the side, then getting an undercut, then traumatizing me little by little, and then shaving half of it off, and then eventually shaving all of it off. I've had my own locks now for, I think at the end of this year, it will be about 12 years. So I'm 11 years in and I'm still afraid to cut my hair. So for something that meant so much that, that you associated with the, I don't want to say realization of coming to self, but more like with the openness of coming out to self and freedom, how did you even let go of it? You know, I, I, I started my own hair coincidentally and I kind of let go of it. For, 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 so for you, so for you, who it was very intentional, how were you able to let go and start again? Can you just take me on that journey? I think I need it personally even. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, for me, I, I, from the beginning, when I started, when I started my, my, look, my first love journey, I told myself that I would carry my hair for eight years and then I would cut it. And the reason I said that was because I knew that at some point, it would be so long and it would get uncomfortable for me. I also knew from research that I had done that, you know, the longer your locks, uh, uh -huh. 
know it or the longer they are or you know that they begin to break and, and which I was experiencing mm-hmm. and also I was also expect when I, when I want to go to sleep you know sometimes I lie on my head when I want to move you know it, it's thin I, I hurt myself you know so I, I just knew that it was time and again I had a, I had a plan from the very beginning mm-hmm. so I told myself that I would cut it and then I will start it again so when I cut the hair I knew that I'm going to start again. That was uh, that was already given. And I think for me, I wasn't really looking at it as losing my freedom. I was looking at it as okay, and me just taking a break from 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 this um, from this particular journey and starting again. So mm. for me, in my life, I'm I'm all about starting over. Mm. You know, I don't I feel like people should be allowed to start over as many times as they like. And so, um, so my my hair is also tied to that bit of starting over. Um, so that's really what it was for me. And I wasn't really, I wasn't going to go back. I wasn't really fixing my hair or relaxing my hair or you know wearing anything. I was just carrying my hair as in its natural form, except that I wasn't. It wasn't locked, mm-hmm. so that's a loan also in itself. It's also a form of freedom, mm-hmm. you know, of expression, and so sorry, an expression of freedom, and so um, so that's what it was. It wasn't something that I was that uh, for me it was part of the plan, and it was just it was something that that, um, that I did because again I felt like okay. Starting over, starting over. And just because you cut something does not mean that you cannot grow it again. Uh, and I, uh, for me, I also see it as a way of showing resilience. Sometimes, you know, you face some things in your life and you feel that you cannot overcome them or that you cannot um, move past them. Mm-hmm. And then you do. You find that that, that you do. Mm-hmm. So I think that um, cutting my hair and starting again is kind of like a reaffirmation to myself to say that there is nothing you cannot overcome. Right. Even if things become so bad, you can always start again. So I don't have any fear of starting again. I don't have a fear of nurturing and growing. Mm. Um, and, and for me, I think that those are the things that were most appealing. Pamela, I think we should start a church because you've just been preaching and I've just been saying, mm, 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 you've been speaking to my soul <laughs> sister. So I think my, my own time is near, it's very near. My commitment with my hair was that I wanted to, I wanted it to grow past my boobs and I wanted to take a picture rising out of the water like a water goddess. And I did that last year. <laughs> so I, I did that last year. I, I did it topless as well, but nobody has seen that picture yet. And fortunately for me, my boobs cooperated. They, they didn't sag too much for my hair not to be able to cover it. So uh, uh, it's not fair. I think you should not want to scale it. <laughs> oh my! But like I'm just like mm, mm, mm. so. I do know that the time is coming where my hair is going, and I, I've always people are like, oh, maybe you should trim it. But I feel like when I started my locks, my commitment to myself was like, if I want to cut it, I'm going to cut it all off and start again. So, yeah. Maybe maybe I'll cheat and trim it for a little bit before I cut it all off. I don't know. I don't know. But I think when I'm ready, I would know that I'm ready. But the conversation has... And, been... and, okay, and I, think, I think another thing too that really helped, that really, you know, made me not feel any type of way is because I know that uh, last class, the hair will shall grow. So... <laughs> I wasn't feeling like oh my god if I cut this thing now one more where 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 am I gonna see hair again? No, I knew that I, that my hair will always grow, so that was an easy decision right. to come to. So, but how are you finding your new locks? So you know you have first of all, traumatized me personally by cutting off strand after strand and making me do it in the beginning. <laughs> and then we went Sorry. getting off the whole sides off. I got used to it. And then one day I just see that everything has gone off and I'm like, okay, well, it's happened. And then when I saw, I think you, you, you we, we posted something about somebody's starter locks 
some months ago and you're like, this is going to be me in February. And I was like, yes, she's coming back. So now yeah. that you are one month into this new journey, how does it feel? How does it feel having baby locks? Because you know that, you, you know how it is. Women that yeah. you know when you come to the salon and you pe- see people who are starting out and they are looking at your gorgeous long hair and they're like, hey, when will my hair be like this? <laughs> when will my yeah. hair be like this? And now you are back to square one. How does that feel? I mean, I don't know. I, I feel like, okay, because I've been on this journey before, so I know what to expect. I know that everything is in stages. You know, I know that uh, that the best way to have those types of lots is to start from scratch. Mm-hmm. Is to is to grow them naturally and grow them until they get there. So I I don't look at people and be envious of them. I already know where I'm going because I've already been there. Mm-hmm. So it's not it's not it's not that I'm I'm just I just look at it and say oh nice nice hair, but I don't. Look at that! I think to myself, "Oh my God, when shall I?" Because I know I shall. Mm. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so I think that that's that's it for me, and I feel like you know, um, I I also look at life in, in that way. You know, life is in stages, and everything has has its its time. So you just one day at a time, one day at a time. Yeah. Okay, um, when I first met you, Pamela, you used to be very corporate. You used to wear suits, you used to wear these tight shoes. Um, I don't even know what they're called, but like I loved your dress sense and I didn't know you worked in the corporate. You already had locks, of course, by the time I met you. Um, I'm just wondering, in such a very corporate world and, you know, being a lesbian woman, and being obvious about being a lesbian woman, because at least from the first time I met you, I did not feel like you were ever hiding, you know. Um, and then having locked hair, how did that impact your, before you said activism, which is now like, I wouldn't say, no, I would say the, the corporate world was more structured and you were working with other people and working under terms of a structured organization. Um, how did your lifestyle, your hair choice, impacts you in that environment was it a positive experience or was it ever negative so luckily for me at that time i was working as I said, in a corporate organization and i was working it was an international um, uh, oil company so uh, such organizations have anti-discrimination policies mm. uh, that discriminates very they, they are very specific that they don't tolerate um, discrimination or harassment uh, based on perceived or real sexual orientation or gender identity. So what that meant, which everybody working there had to agree to, what that meant was that nobody could harass you because they think you are lesbian or gay or bisexual or queer, Mm -hmm. and nobody could fire you because they think you are lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, trans, whatever. Mm -hmm. So... So it was it was an environment that so if, even if you were a homophobic person, when you come to work, you leave your homophobia at the gates. Mm-hmm. Then you now go inside. <laughs> when you come back, you can pick your homophobia and keep it going. But why while you are inside there, where me and you we have to interact or we have work to to do, you cannot discriminate against me because of that. You you cannot ask me silly questions. You cannot, because you know harassment is not just is, is not just about um, doing something. Harassment is also about making somebody feel uncomfortable in the work environment. Mm-hmm. So and uh, that can be from maybe making snide remarks or comments mm-hmm. or or asking stupid questions. You know, just or just having or maybe even cracking stupid or good jokes yeah. that make people feel um, uncomfortable. So. Everybody understood that, and so it was just about work. People who were my friends were my friends. We went to lunch together, or whatever. But the conversation about my sexuality never, ever, ever came up. So me being the person that I am, I, I mean, I, I can't find me in a, in a dress. I can't wear a dress because I have worked somewhere. So I always wore my suits and my pants and my shoes. 
I kept it really, really nice. And people always gave me compliments. So whether they gave me compliments on one side and then they must something else later, I don't know. They must send it to me. I didn't ask that, okay, you know, but I was able to do my work and do it well um, while I was there without having to necessarily change anything about me. Awesome, awesome. Um, um, that's, well... Oof, there's a lot to learn and a lot that we can adopt from this conversation. I really do hope that this conversation helps somebody out there to break the stereotype in their mind and realize that there's there's only one race and it's the human race. And once we know that we are all flesh and blood, like a hair choice, sexual orientation, should tribe, race shouldn't be a measure to measure each other and hate each other and, you know, harass each other. So. Absolutely. And, you know, if for anything, you know, it should be about diversity and knowing that um, the rainbow has many different colors. Mm. And it's such a beautiful image because of the colors, not because it's all black or all white or all green, but because it's red, yellow, green, purple, you know, there's now, you know, different, different colors. And I think that that is what gives enjoy, brings enjoyment to life. And I feel like if people are able, if the rainbow wasn't able to exist as the rainbow, if people are not able to exist as they are, then it doesn't really bring out the full potential. You won't see the beauty. People will not be able to give their best self. The rainbow will not will not look as beautiful. Um, it wouldn't even be a sign of um, of hope. Because, you know, Christians will tell you that when God destroyed the world with water, you know, when uh, Noah came out of the ark or whatever, and he saw the rainbow, and uh, God, him and God, uh, God made a, a promise to him that he never again destroyed the earth with water. I'm not a Christian, I'm just giving mm-hmm. an example for Christians. So he made a promise to Noah or to the world, whatever, that he never destroyed the earth with water again. And the rainbow was supposed to be the sign of the agreement, you know, that you will never do that. So, so the rainbow in itself is is an expression of diversity, of freedom, of 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 hope, you know. Uh, so, um, so I I think that you know if people are just able to exist and to just allow to be and to flourish, then there is no. There is no telling where the human race can can go, but I feel like if we keep seeing, if we keep um, using our differences to harm ourselves and to prevent people from getting opportunities or being their best self, mm-hmm. then I feel it does all of us a disservice, and I, and I think there's so much waste and loss that can come from from that. So, right. that's my take. Oh, um, we've been speaking for quite some time now and I still have a few more questions to go. So I'm going to try and get it all in so I don't take up all of your time. Um, the next question I have is kind of around caring for your locks. Some people think that it's expensive, it's stressful. And yet a lot of us that have locks express freedom when we, when we you know, start to experience our lock journey. So how is caring for your locks for you? And I think I would like you to speak, speak about it from two sides, having long hair for a long time, and then now going back to really short hair. Um, how is caring for... Your old locks, or how was caring for your old locks, and how is caring for this one right now? So I, I think that um, you know, being having baby locks as I do now, and having mature long locks as I did then, are two different journeys. And because there are two different journeys and at two different stages, the care regimen would be completely different, or different in most cases. For me, I'm the kind of person that I believe that less is more. Mm-hmm. So I don't really put a lot of things in my hair. I just have my lock cream and my shampoo. That's it. I don't put any mixture. I don't put anything. I don't put oils. Nothing. I don't put anything um, apart from those two things. And then maybe um, 
that thing for anti-dandruff. Okay. Uh, that spray, that's water-based. Yeah. So apart from those things, I don't, I don't put anything else. So, but I feel like at the beginning of the love journey, um, that is where you're setting the foundation. So you want to use products that are water-based, that will not leave residue because it's at this stage that you know, residue builds. So the only thing that you did in your hair now that, that sits there, that's where, that's, it is later in your work journey that you will see the effects of it. Um, so for me, I, I just, uh, as I said, those are the same the, the products that I use. I use water-based products. Less is more. I'm just uh, trying to keep the hair clean um, and make sure that it, it has a good foundation growing. Mm-hmm. Um, going to the to um, adult stage. Right. By the time your your locks are already um, in the adult stage, you don't really need much because your hair has already formed the consistency and it just grows mm-hmm. into that. So for me, it was just about going for retwists um, or not. Mm-hmm. Some people uh, get to that point and they want to be free form, mm-hmm. free form as, so they just let their hair grow naturally without them um, having to retwist it. Um, and another point, really, again, is really about keeping it clean, you know, uh, just uh, making sure that it's healthy, not putting anything that will damage your hair or make your hair break or cut. Um, that's it. So I'm, I'm not one of those people that, I know there are people that, that do it, you know, but I'm not one of those people that really puts in more, uh, as in plenty products in the hair. And I think that's one of the reasons why okay, it's so easy for me to just keep it going. Right. Um, it has been very interesting watching you grow as a person and as a friend over the years. And um, I know that I have received a lot of support from you personally in all the things that I do, Locketude, and you're one of our biggest fans, you know. Um, I do remember, um, I believe that the first time we met, I was still using like a short letter apartment for my hair studio. I was kind of confused. I think I still had a corporate job myself at that point. I didn't really know what I wanted to do in my life, you know. And um, you came in and you were like, you know, I like what you're doing and I think it will grow. And then we moved to that very small space in, on Etiosa and then we moved to the plaza and you know we've kind of grown with each other and in my growing I've also seen you grow move from the corporate world start the film um become a filmmaker um I, I kind of witnessed you shoot a documentary which I have been planning to shoot one for the past four or five years now I don't know when that will come to fruition and you have shot a whole movie oh my god like Pamela, who yeah. are you? <laughs> How did that even happen? Like the transformation <laughs> has been like awesome. When I saw the trailer for the movie, I was like, "Oh my god!" I don't think I could even send you a congratulations, a congratulatory message because I was overwhelmed. Like I can't wait to see it yet. I, I wish I had seen it before we had this conversation. But can you just tell us a little bit about the movie? I can't help it. And maybe tell people where they can find it and how we can watch it. Because when I get off this podcast, I'm definitely jumping on, you know, the internet to find the movie and watch it. So, uh, I mean, I always, I think of myself, first of all, I think of myself as a, as a major shareholder in looking to you because <laughs> as you said, as you said, we, we, la mia, I used start together from those days when I used to, we, we used to come to that small hotel room or mm-hmm. shop, uh, shop left apartment, there was a bed that just one chair and it was so tight and everybody would just like, you know, just stay there and just, you didn't have so many customers, but I, I remember I kept telling you, just between what, what you're doing, it will grow, trust me, it will grow, it will grow, and uh, look at you today now. Don't blow. Why not? Blow, okay. Why not there yeah. yet? So why not there yet? <laughs> <laughs> anybody that has that, anybody that has that, that has that like this thing, they're not coming to Lucky Two. Uh, where are they actually going? <laughs> no, so that's that's where Lucky Two is um, is you know today, and I'm so proud of you for you know sticking to it and and really making it what it has become. I'm honestly so proud. Anybody that that has that. that 
and they ask me, ah, where did your hair? Ah, look at you. You know, so I'm um, big ambassador for you, for, for you. I really believe in what you're doing. And, you know, so keep it, keep it going and keep growing. Um, regarding the film, so the film is called Ife, and Ife is a short film about um, Ife and Adora, who are two women who fall in love over a three-day date. And um, as the date goes on, um, a major secret is revealed. And then uh, the two women have to decide, okay, how much are we really... Please don't spoil this movie for me. Don't spoil it. I want to go No, no, no. It. I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> you still watch it now. It's just I'm just giving you the, you know, the log line. You understand? So, um, so, yeah. So, they have to decide, okay, how much are we going to sacrifice for us to sustain our, our love and so everything plays out from then on. Mm -hmm. So that's what the film is about. And um, so how did I become a filmmaker? So Ali, as as you said, you you were there from the beginning when we shot Under the Rainbow, which you are also you were also part of. Um, and uh, you know you also you, you watched us do this uh Ifair thing. So if I was the executive producer of the fair, is the quality hub, the organization that I work for. So the whole idea is we wanted to use film, visual storytelling, as a tool for advocacy, to to use storytelling to change people's hearts and minds towards um, uh, social acceptance of um, LGBTQ women and LGBT people in general. And so um, what happened was... Uh, um, you know, we we actually got funding to to um, to show to to sort of a tour across Nigeria with Under the Rainbow, which is the documentary mm -hmm. that, that I made, um, you know, in 2018. But then uh, the funding came late, came a bit late, and then um, you know we're now faced with. Um, a situation where we couldn't do what we wanted to do with the money because of COVID. Mm -hmm. And so we had to decide what to do with all this money that we had. And so um obviously trying to stay within our our focus mm -hmm. and our vision as as a as an organization and the kind of work that we were, that we're trying to do. So we started to make a short film because Obviously, that kind of film does not exist in Nigeria. Nobody has ever done it. Um, so we decided to, to do because you know you have many films that, that, that are LGBT themed that have been done by other organizations in Nigeria, um, but none like Ife. Mm -hmm. In the sense that others have been focused with, on men, so gay men, and you know stories that have to do with, with men, but. Nobody has ever told a story about two women uh, whose whose uh, stories were being centered as the major theme of the film, mm -hmm. and so we decided to to do it. Um, so that's that's really what it is. Um, right now, the film is out. It it has already gone to about uh, twelve film festivals across the world. You know, it has been to. Almost all the major LGBT films. <laughs> I feel like I need but like one of those sirens you have in the club to like you know maybe <laughs> pop something with. Please send me my champagne. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's been incredibly successful. People have really welcomed it. People have loved it. The reviews have been awesome. They've written multiple reviews about it. Um. So now the film is at. Um, EHTV network, so www.ehtvnetwork.com, um, and that's where the film is sitting. And anybody anywhere in the world can go over there um, and pay a little fee, about six, seven dollars, euros, to watch the film. Um, the proceeds go back to what's helping us to tell more stories. Because we're actually planning a sequel. So if there is a short film, it's about 35 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, but the script for the next one, which continues the story, is a long, is a, mm -hmm. is a feature length film. So it's much longer. Oh. Um, so, so all of this support goes to help to make sure that that actually um, becomes a reality.
Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Really. Oh. Um, so how how did I get there? I think for me, so you know, at the beginning stages of my activism, I was always you know, very angry and shouting all the time. <laughs> but you know, you cannot really continue with that energy. <laughs> so you have to find a way to channel it into something meaningful, something people can actually engage with, something that creates impact, and something that um, that that can actually do the work for you without you having to shout all the time. Mm-hmm. So that's really what um, that's really what got me got me there. And to be honest with you, I'm a creative at heart. So it was easy for me to just transition into that role. Wow. Awesome. I have learned so much from this conversation. I've learned a bit more about the LGBT community itself. Um I have also learned about the freedom that you can come to just in being true to who you are and the choices that you make, including deciding to wear your hair natural or in whatever form that you choose. Um, And that expression of self is like really one of those things that allows us to grow. Um, We've also talked a little bit about shedding some of the colonial um, mentality that still exists within us we've also learned through your starting cutting your hair and starting over again and starting in different forms in your life over and over again that resilience is a character that you can build and really and truly your self-expression is a way to 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 show it um we've also talked about preconceptions that we have about each other that kind of need to change and people are not defined by their beliefs, their bisexuality, by their color of their skin, their religion, and all of that. Um, So this conversation has really been packed. And I think um, one of the two most useful things that, or three, I'll say, let me save this three. I don't even know which one to start with. I think uh, most of the organizations in Nigeria need to adopt anti-discrimination policies. People should be free to be themselves in their place of work because I think that's where it starts from. People are trying to find a decent um, form of living and then you start discriminating against their hair, their sexuality, their color of their skin. I hear there are some companies that don't employ some girls if they're not yellow enough. You know, it's just ridiculous. So we need to kind of that uh, an active companies and organizations need to actively, you know, adopt anti-discrimination policies. So that's one. Um, two, I would say is that um, what joins us together is that we're all from one race, and that's the human race. And last but not the least, we cannot be shouting all the time. Let's just do, just, you know, channel that energy <laughs> into work. And we cannot be shouting all the time. So one final and last question for you, because I think this is potentially the longest podcast I've actually shot or recorded so far, um, is what advice do you have to anyone out there who is looking at locks as a hair choice um, into expressing themselves and coming out um, what advice do you have for them? Well, um, I mean, you know, I always find it difficult to, to answer this question when people ask me, you know, because I feel like everybody's reality is different. Mm. And now when not the person with the wear the shoe, not the person know where it's in the picture. Mm. So uh, I feel like, you know, people should take stock of what's happening in their lives to where they are and make a decision about what to do, where you are, what you think about the future and um, how, how you want to get there. For me, my hair is a form of expression. For some people, it may not be so. For some people, it may be something else. But for people that want to have that, uh, for me, it has been a very beautiful experience, um, starting something from scratch, and I mean from scratch, like zero, and watching it grow, nurturing it for eight years, it's, it, you know, it's, it became this big thing. Um, I, I think that uh, just that experience alone has been rewarding. It, it has taught me lessons about life. Um, and uh, so it has been a great journey, and if anybody wants to embark on it, just know that it's a journey. 
Yeah, this dada you see that looks very beautiful, it didn't happen overnight. You know, there, there's a lot of care and attention that goes into it. So, so just know that don't come in with high expectations that, oh, I'll knock my head today, next week it will now be this beautiful thing. It doesn't work like that. Um, um, then for people who might be wanting to come out, well, I don't know, as I said, you're the one wearing the show, you know where, where your life is, you know what's going on. So this decision to come out or not to come out is completely yours. Um, and, you know, make sure that when you take a, a decision that you're able to, you're willing and able to live with it for the rest of your life. So whether it is, or for the, for the time being, because you might decide to do something today and tomorrow you might decide to, to change mm-hmm. course. So also just don't be too, um, don't put too much pressure on yourself that, oh my God, I must see this through. And if I don't see it, it means I'm, a, I'm this and that. No, it's nothing like that. Just take it one day at a time. When you decide to do something, go ahead and do it. If you feel along the way that, okay, this is similar, I say, you know, the two work like this, make a change out like this, it's still okay. Um, <laughs> the, whole point, the whole point is that you keep moving and that you're not stagnant and you keep learning and keep growing. So for me, that would be, that would be my own advice. Yeah, keep it moving. Do not be stagnant. Keep growing. And um, one step at a time. Yeah, one step at a time, definitely. Thank you so, so, so much. I cannot thank you enough. This has been, again, another informative, educative, and entertaining um, session. And um, I'm going to go and watch you fair. That's just going to wrap it up um, right now. Go and watch you fair. Everybody I'm going to watch you fair. I'm going to watch you fair. So yeah, thank you so much, Pamela. It's been an honor having you on the show. Yes. Thank you so much, Adi. Ife has an Instagram page. Um, it's at Ife underscore movie. So at I-F-E underscore M-O-V-I-E. So follow Ife on Instagram. When you click on the link on the first profile, you will be, you'll take you directly to watching Ife. And tell everybody you know, <laughs> Yeah, support us. Thank you so much, Adi. It's been my pleasure. All right, then. Have a good one. (laughs) All right, you too. Bye. Bye. So, I did watch Ife, and I quite enjoyed it. I now very much look forward to seeing the sequel. As promised in the beginning of this episode, I do have a giveaway for you. You can watch Ife for a 10% discount using the promo code I will provide to you shortly. But first, you can find a link to the movie on their official Instagram page at Ife underscore movie. At Ife underscore movie is spelled I-F-E underscore movie, which is M-O-V-I-E. At checkout, you can apply the promo code Locketude 10. Locketude is spelled L-O-C-I-T-U-D-E and then the number 10. In case you didn't get that, I'll say it in NATO phonetic alphabet for you. So it's Lima Oscar Charlie, India Tango Uniform, Delta Echo and then the number 10. Locketude 10. This allows you to receive your 10% discount. This discount has been graciously provided to us. Um, the Talking Locks with Locketude listeners by the Equality Hub and EHTV Network. So thank you very much, guys. In our next episode, we will be taking things down a notch and be speaking to a locked couple in love. That episode is one that you really want to listen to. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Talking Locks podcast with Locketude. It has been such a pleasure being your host. My name again is Adi Balogo. And thanks to our producer, Savage Media. Please don't forget to follow us on social media. We are at Locketude, L-O-C-I-T-U-D-E. And you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And for more interesting podcast episodes on Everyday People with Lock, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. We are currently on Google, Apple, Stitcher, and Spotify Podcasts. You can also find us on YouTube. And don't forget to keep it locked with an attitude. Bye.